Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, episode 24 with Mark Campbell. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. Uh, we've got a great guest for for this next episode. His uh, name's Mark Campbell and he is the Head of Coaching and Assistant Academy Manager of Wolverhampton Wanderers Academy. Uh, and I've, I've known Mark for, for quite a few years and uh, first met many years ago on an FA course. Um, and uh, we we're both uh, a lot earlier on in our, on our careers and uh, really Really proud to have seen him work his way up in the academy to head of coaching and assistant academy manager, and uh, he's uh, he's done that at one of the the, the best academies in the country, uh, as classified by um, the Premier League's uh, EPPP system, and also in terms of their uh, prolific nature in producing first team players. Uh, for their club and also um, uh, England players for for the numerous England teams. So really, really privileged to have him on the show to share his journey and also tell us about the great work going on at Wolves Academy, uh, making great strides. I've been up there several times. Um, uh, obviously, they're a partner club, so they use the they use the uh, My Personal Football Coach app uh, for their for their young players as a homework training portal. Uh, so privileged to have been up there myself and uh, witnessed a really amazing facility, uh, one of the best in the country, and also great staff uh, with some uh, with a great working methodology. So really privileged to have him on the show so he can share his journey and share some of the quality work they're doing. And there's lots of uh, fantastic value uh, and knowledge to share for for all you guys out there interested in elite player development. Um, yeah, apologies, we haven't had that many shows out recently. Been trying to um, catch up with things. I've been doing lots of travelling, as you may know. Um, been to Canada twice in the last few weeks, visiting partner clubs uh, over there, um, uh, delivering high performance cl- camps, and also recently been to Amsterdam uh, with my work with Rebel FC, the YouTube team. But when I was there, I was lucky enough to uh, spend some time watching some sessions in the academy. Uh, love spending time at Ajax. Been there several times in a few years. Uh, you know the the importance they they uh, put on uh, ball mastery one v one and small sided games, particularly in the foundation phase. As you know, that's my uh, akin to my methodology as well. So really good to see them working that really effectively. Uh, got some great ideas and saw some sessions uh, which I really liked. So um, uh, when I'm going to be posting those sessions on my personal football coach on the coaches pass for the coaches there who subscribe to that. Also, um, when I'm traveling as well, I've been doing uh, recording lots of my own sessions that I've been doing, uh, some full sessions as well. So I've been editing those together and then I'm going to be posting those on the coaches pass as well. So um, the coaches pass, if you don't know, it's a lot, big library of uh, skills and practices and ball mastery exercises, but also team sessions uh, from myself and from other academies around the world and other coaches uh, from pro football as well. So building up a nice uh, quality library of uh, exercises for for coaches to utilise. So uh, that's coming on really really nicely and uh, just really now just like uh, building uh, more and more uh, uh, club partnerships around the world. So supporting clubs and players individually uh, with the app. So the app's going from strength to strength. And so uh, just looking forward to now um, kicking on with that this year and supporting player development all around the world. Got one little other thing we just want to tell you about, another little project. Uh, I've got a new YouTube channel starting up called Inside the Academy. Um, there we're going to be hosting all the podcasts there now. So it's going to be different from the My Personal Football Coach YouTube channel. And also we've got some uh, some new quality content coming out there as well, some specific exciting new content. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, just go to my personal football coach and sign up for the uh, for the email, and you'll get you'll get posts about uh, this new quality content coming. Because in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be um, we're going to be releasing our first new exciting project on the Inside the Academy uh, YouTube channel. But uh, without further ado, let's get into the show. So, Mark Campbell, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Just uh, can you just give a little bit of a, a brief. Um, 
background about your uh, about your 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 playing and coaching experience up to this date. Yeah, good. Yeah, so I never I didn't play at a top level. I played amateur amateur football, um, but I got stuck into coaching quite early on, about seventeen eighteen, um, and sort of just got the book for it. Really started off doing a, a small school team, and then started doing grassroots, which I think really paved the way for for where I am now. Really, um, I've enjoyed it ever since. You know, I've, I've done lots of different levels, uh, boys football, girls football, and enjoyed every part of the experience. So it's um, it's been really good. So just tell us about then your progression. Uh, how did you know into your first academy job? Then how that yep. to your obviously and your, your what your role is now. Yeah, right. So when I first started, as I say, I was doing schools and, and grassroots football, and I was lucky enough to get a part time job with the, the wards in the community, which was again just going around schools, coaching, fun football, etc. Uh, and that developed to a full time job with the community guys. So again, I was really fortunate after getting into part time work with them. You know, three or four months later, I was uh, I was full time, and you know, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every moment of that, and it really gave me a sort of grounding to work with young players. Um, and then fortunately enough, again, a, a full-time job with the academy come up after me being there part-time for two or three months. Um, I got a full-time job with the academy. So I left the community department, went to the academy. The role was then technical um, development officer, which was basically eight to twelve, um, looking after their development program, which I suppose is now the, the foundation lead role. So I, um, I was in there for in that role for two or three years. Then it evolved to the foundation lead. So I was doing a similar role, but new title. Um, which again I enjoyed because I think the, the basis and the foundation I got from, from coaching grassroots and schools football really helped me empathise and, and, and develop young players at the club. And then as our, as our staffing structure grew, um, I progressed to assistant kind of manager, which again provided a different challenge. Um, still working with players, but I progressed to work with the older players then. Um, we took on a, a lad called John Hunter Barrett, who's working with the foundation phase now, who's excellent um, with, the, with the team of staff he's got. So my role evolved to assistant kind of manager which again, a bit of admin stuff, uh, organisation of the programme, supporting the academy manager um, and supporting the transition of players through the foundation phase to youth and hopefully into the pro phase. And then again, probably 18 months or so now, my role and evolved again to um, head of coach and development. So um, again, I've been really fortunate to be at, at Wolves for, for such a long time now, around 13 years. But again, I've done schools football, I've done academy football, very young players, and I've evolved all the way through the club, which is which is a testament to the club because it believes in young coaches, which is um, which is excellent for me, really. So that's quite an, an amazing journey from uh, grassroots all the way up to uh, mm-hmm. head of coaching. Just tell us a little bit about your your role as head of coaching. This is like a new new role, is it? You know, post EP, E Triple P, I think. Just tell us a little bit about yep. everyone what exactly your job is entails and and what you do day to day. Okay, well, uh, at Wolves, it's quite interesting. We've we've divided our role up, actually. So the head of coach and development role has been divided up into three phases, youth, foundation, and, and pro phase. So my role, head of coach and development, but I mainly look at the, the 13 to 16s age group. Um, and I'd say it runs across three strands, and it's very similar for foundation and, and for pro as well. Um, part of my role is to support the players and the development and their pathway from foundation into the development phase, youth development phase, sorry, and then, and then obviously out into phase um move a part of my role is to support the coaches so where are they at in terms of qualifications what's their development action plan where do they want to go and how can i support that with um with my mentoring skills and also the help of the fa and other staff within the club get them to where they want to be uh, and also to develop the program you know and again it's not just the coaching program it's the the player development pathway looking at how we develop the players and, and how can i evolve and how can we evolve that program to produce more players for for ultimately the first team so what's, the, what's the difference between what you're doing now and, and your old role as assistant academy manager? Um, it's, it's a little bit different. Now I'm working with the coaching staff more um, and helping them develop. Um, assistant academy manager role was more um, administration, organisation of the programme, which again I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and I was able to coach a little bit more of them. With my role evolving now, it's less coaching in terms of actually having a team, but again, just getting on the grass and supporting the coaches, which is which is nice because I can get to sort of butterfly around different groups, um, which I sort of enjoy more really because not being attached to a group, I get to have an overview of all the players and again support the coaches in what they what they want to do. So then, just just go a bit more into detail. They talk about supporting the coaches. Yeah, that does that look like? Are you are you like you know? Watching their session, giving them feedback, or what's yeah. what's exactly look? What's the nitty gritty of that role? Yeah, so each coach will have a development action plan. So again, where they want to be and how we're going to help them develop. So we might pinpoint a coach's area for development as communication. 
So we'll put then a place in a plan in place to help them develop their communication skills on and off the pitch with the players and with other staff members. And then my supporting role then will be to, to support them by um, videoing a session, um, being around that session and doing a formal evaluation of a coaching session focused around communication, for example, because that's what he needs to work on. Okay, how did you communicate? What was your what was your manner like? What was your player engagement like? And okay. What can we do then to, to, be, to develop that and help take it forward? And then after a couple of months, we'll reassess it, do an informal evaluation of the session. And again, the coach reflects on how he performed in terms of his communication. Um, and then a third part of the, the evaluation process, process, again, to do a formal one, where we'll video the coach, break it down, sit down with the coach and look at, you know, help him reflect on, on his communication strategies and, and how he's felt he's developed over the season. And again, if we think we need to put a further plan in place, we can do that if the coach is happy and with his sort of evolution and his improvements over the season, then fantastic. We can focus on another area for, for him to develop. And you, you mentioned there the FA as well. Just um, just talk about how they they support you in that role. What's that What's that look like practically? Yeah, so again, the, the FA obviously work in, in different sort of capacities. One, they come and support the formal, the formal development of coach qualifications, you know, advanced youth award, A licence, B licence, etc. Um, but one of the FA staff members now is actually supporting me with my mentoring. So again, just making sure that I mentor effectively, looking at my evaluation techniques, that's just something that I wanted to personally develop um, just to make me more effective in my role, really. So um, I'm quite big on personal development and it's something I'm keen to do. So, um, you know, so getting the, the, the FA to support me with that has been, has, been, has been very good for me, really, personally. So how much, how much time do those, I mean, what's, what's the um, acronym now for the, for the FA person who comes in? Are they changing it, F-A-Y or something? What's, what's the... F-A-Y-C-E now, F-A coach um, educator, I think it is. So then how, You've coached developer. How often, those, how often those guys come in and support you guys at the club? Um, our, our guy Craig Hinton's very good. He's he's literally in once every week, every two weeks, and he's at the end of the phone. We probably speak at least once a week, just catch up on coaches, how they developed, um, what I've been doing to support the coaching staff. And again, he's not just supporting me. He supports he supports John with the foundation phase and, and Steve when needed with the with the professional phase as well. Um, and Craig's good because he comes into our CPD events. We have a, a CPD probably once every six weeks or so. To support the coaching staff uh, and he's, he's really good to get involved in that and, and support in any way that we, we need him to so he's, he's excellent really I mean I mean logistically you guys are pretty close to St George's Park and mm-hmm. to other, I mean do you, sort of, then, do you obviously um, get more benefits than that I mean I, I know I've been up there and we've seen your boys up there quite a lot you know demoing sessions and that do you, yeah. do you, do you get to utilise that facility and, and that having that that great um, that great uh, support mechanism next to you yeah, I think um, we've we've got a really good relationship with the FA, and as you said, we've we've been supporting you know um, qualifications, advanced youth award, uh, just in terms of bringing groups across because so many of our coaches now have been on that journey. It's nice for I believe for the FA to get our coaches and our players in to see how our players have evolved and benefited from our coaches being on those courses. As luck would have it, we're actually going to the FA next week to do a study visit just for a day. And we're taking our heads of departments across just to look at different areas, sports science, coaching, etc. Um, and again, it's great for the FA to open the doors for us so we can um, personally develop, you know, across each department. So uh, that's next week, actually. So it's good. Yeah, good I mean, timing. I'm just comparing to the clubs I've been. We had um, uh, the, 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 F, the guys from the FA come in, but I don't think we, didn't, we never had them that, that consistently regularly. So they all... Mm-hmm. Was a real big help when they came in, but we never had them, you know, once or twice. Yeah, or much more sporadically. So yeah, quite- yeah, and I, I think that's a conscious effort from the FA now to, to get more, you know, coach educators around clubs. But again, our our, um, our coach educator has been excellent. He's just so keen to be involved and and develop and be part of our program. It's uh, it's been great for our staff. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's been great for our staff. And it's been great for for our coaching staff and, and our players as well to see the FA guys around. And and just to, just briefly that. Is that I mean that that splitting of the head coaching head of coaching role is that is that do you know if that's mm-hmm. a, a consistent thing now amongst other clubs are they are they head of coaching of from younger age groups to, and then you know different different age groups head of coaching? But yeah, to be honest with you, I think we're quite unique. And again, there might be some listeners who, who will tell me to, to the contrary. Um, but they, I, I believe that most clubs now have an appointed head of coaching, head of coaching in place, and, and his role is to support the, the coaching staff right the way through the club. And again, we've been a little bit different. Um, we've got some good staff here, so we thought we'd, we'd think the box a little bit and really dig down into into specifying um, staff to work with, with coaches per phase. And I think it's been really really useful actually, just so I can concentrate, for example, on the third 
13 to 16s coaches on how they develop. Um, it, it, it's been very useful, and I think the coaches have benefited from that. Now, again, other clubs work in different ways, and I think it's important that you get structure in place that fits and works for your club. It just happens that this splitting of the role uh, in terms of you know responsibilities works really well for, for Wolves. And in terms of John John's role, the head, the head of coaching for the foundation phase, I know John is a top coach and top guy. What yep. he what's what's the difference between his what he's doing now and then what he was doing as lead lead of phase of the yeah? Is there much is there much practical difference? The, uh, I'd say the, the biggest difference is his actual role of supporting the coaches. So again, you know, his his role now is to evaluate, support, and reflect with coaches uh, probably a lot more than he would have done as foundation lead, which would have probably been a little more organisation capacity. Jumping in with groups, working with and helping develop the players, but now, as you know, as I said earlier, it's, it's probably three strands now. He's not just developing players in his role; he's also developing coaches and developing the program um, to make sure that's an effective program for the foundation boys to, to come through. So it's been exciting. It's been exciting to see how the roles develop for, for myself, John, and and Steve Burns, who does the the older phase. Um, but it's worked well, and I think that the program's benefited from us us three actually having a specific age group to work with. You know, in terms of a phase, sorry. So then, John does. That, so there's no um, lead foundation phase anymore. That that role's been is obviously yeah. So yeah, John John's sort of evolved into that head of coaching for the foundation phase. Now, what we've done now is we've split the foundation phase into cells, like again many clubs do, and we've near enough got a full time staff member to look after nines and tens, elevens, twelves, and, and going through the age groups. So um, we've been fortunate enough to, to have a, a good push in terms of recruiting good staff in a full time capacity. Um, so that's been that's been a positive for the club as well. So that's 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 their role now, sort of mini cell leads, as it were, rather than one person just overseeing, um, like a foundation lead. We've got the head of coaching development for the foundation phase, but also little cell leads for for each group. So then, in theory, so 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 um, so, so one coach would be head of nice tens, for instance. The other one would be head yeah. So then, that's, yeah, so he'll he'll look after both groups but how does that work does he take one group and then monitor the other one or does he switch up yeah so he will take one group for a period of time uh, and then whilst monitoring and supporting the coaches when he can but again that's John's role to, to, to oversee that for the foundation phase um, while supporting the, the, the lead coach um, and then what will happen is uh, uh, during the season he'll he'll flip over and work with the other group as well just to get to know the players a little bit better really and get to know the parents and build that relationship up you know um, and support the coaching staff as well because it's nice to have a full-time staff member with a part-time staff member just to, to give them that support as well as what, what John and I would provide um, so that's that's how we, we currently work and I think it's it's, it's working well so then, okay, let's dive in a little bit. Tell us about the um, the foundation phase, a little bit about the structure mm -hmm. works, how many times are the boys in? Yep. Yep. So the boys will be in four days a week in our foundation phase. Uh, it works out around seven, seven and a half, eight hours a week in, in, in terms of the structure we've got. Uh, it's, it's quite a varied program. We've got a, a ball, we have two ball mastery hours uh, during the week. Uh, we utilise uh, my personal football coach as well, the online tool to help the, the boys develop technically. Um, so that's twice a week. <coughs> We also do a futsal indoor program, um, which is once a week. So once every other week per age group, and again that's just utilise indoor uh, indoor futsal four um, v four five v five um, games that we like to, we like to try and do with the foundation phase. Um, but we've also been lucky enough to get a multi sports program uh, in place for the younger ones as well, which we we're incorporating. Tennis, we've done karate, um, and we're just looking at different sports to incorporate to, to those guys. So it's a, a very technical focused, you know, ball mastery um, program, but also we've got to add some variety in as well in terms of multi sports, futsal, indoor football, etc. So it's a, it's a nice program, it's a varied program, um, but it's underpinned by hard work. So everything that the, the young boys do has to be around hard work because that's part of the, the Wolves way, and we try and promote that right from very early on through to our, our 18s and 23s. So, yeah, I mean, um, that sounds like a great programme, lots of lots of variability. So you talk about multi-sports there, so for instance, karate. How, yep. what, when, how long do they do these other things? When, how does that fit into the structure? And what, is there a certain time each week they do it or they do blocks? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so we have a multi-sports multi -sports hour um, per week. And again, that's depending on the, the, the staffing for, the, for the, you know, the, the additional sports. So a tennis group, for example, we would do one tennis hour for the under nines for one week. The following week, the tens would do a tennis hour. Um, and very, that was similar with karate. So again, it's, it's a good opportunity for the boys to, to get some variety into their programme. So it's not just football all the time. Appreciate that some clubs you know, like to specialise and like players to specialise very early on. Uh, we're slightly different. 
you know, we try and encourage our boys to do different sports at school and, and with us. Uh, and he's just giving them a different experience, really. So we enjoy that and the staff enjoy it, seeing that the boys do something different. Um, so at the moment now it's tennis, which is just, just nice as the weather's trying to improve. I think it's like you mentioned there about specialisation. I think what you're doing is most clubs are doing now. They say, look, this is your main sport. Do lots of, mm-hmm. much as possible, but obviously do other things as well. Rather, you know, as in, in an elite environment, obviously you've got to, you know, folk have a one main sport, but then obviously do other things as well. So you, you're still getting that yeah. balance. I think they, um, I think someone talked about it being like early, you know, it's not specific, <clears throat> of early interaction or something. So, you know, you've got your main sport, but you're still doing other stuff as well. Yeah, I, com- I completely agree. And, you know, you look at some elite sports, I think gymnastics, a lot of the, the boys who, who are involved in gymnastics just specialise in that. Um, again, I think football is probably a little bit different. I think we should encourage, it's my personal opinion, we should encourage the boys at an early age to do as many different sports as they can because, you know, we know the retention rates in football anyway aren't always great. I think also the, doing different sports and, 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 and multi-sports in, in particular is, is great for their movements, great for their understanding, cognitive learning. Um, and, you know, if they can do as many different things as they, as they can at a young age, fantastic, because it's about having fun and enjoying sport. Um, you know, and there's plenty of time for them to, to specialise as they get older. And, and that's, that's part of our programme. But, um, you know, I'd encourage any player to do as many different sports as they can at an early age. And, and obviously football's great because they want to do football, which is which is the main focus. But if you can do swimming and, and tennis as well, fantastic. And so to talk about, I mean, I know you've got a bit of a day release programme going on. Mm-hmm. Day's face. How does that work then? Yeah, so our boys are coming around 8.30. Uh, and it's quite an intense day, quite a busy day for the boys. Um, part of their morning will be individual specifics. So what we do with that is, we we obviously boys have, have targets for through PMA and, and, and I'm sure all the listeners will know that, that each player will have a specific set of two or three targets. So um, so the first hour will have individual specifics so they, the boys can actually go and focus on what they want to improve on. Now, it's completely player-led, you know, right the way through from under 11s to, to 16s is, uh, you know, our school release programme. So so boys who come in, if, if a player needs to work on, you know, um, mediums long passing, for example... <clears throat> he can go and work on that in, in, in individual specifics hour. Now, what we're trying to emphasise is the boys go and find a partner to work with who's got a similar talk to encourage a sort of social interaction and get the boys setting their own practice up um, to, to work on that. Now, we'll support them if we need to, but again, the emphasis is on the players making their own decision and taking ownership of their learning. So that will be you know the first day of our, our day reach programme. The boys do education. They'll do um, English and maths throughout the day. And also an additional subject, which the school may specify they need to, to, to improve on. And then also the boys will do a technical tactical session, depending on their age group, um, followed by some small sided games. There'll also be a gym session in there as well, um, strength and core work, and then also a video, video analysis. So it's a very busy day. And, you know, you kind of think, well, how can we fit it all in? We do, because um, the coaching staff and the support staff around the, the club are excellent in terms of their timings. But, um, you know, the, the boys enjoy it. They love school release. That's probably their favourite day of the week. Because probably because get to get come out of school, yeah. but um, <laughs> but they um, they enjoy it because there's so much variety. You know, they love the analysis sessions. They love going in the gym, um, working on the technique and lifting and, and and that sort of stuff with the sports science guys. But um, you know, they, they they enjoy the variety. But then I mean, so that what eleven's the first is the first. Uh, yep. The men are they. Yes, yeah. So uh, again, some clubs have, I believe, under nines, tens in. Um, we don't tend to do that. We have some under tens who come in with our elevens, but generally it's under elevens that we we start our um, our school release program for. Okay, interesting. And so, just a little bit about the you know the um, the, the methodology we talked about. It's built based on technique and ball mastery. Uh, yeah. But I mean, talk about you know in terms of how you want the boys to play and and then how you encourage the coaches to develop that within their sessions. Yeah, so we have a clear playing philosophy at the club. It's based around four phases. Um, and, and literally, when players come in at six, seven, eight, you know, we, we speak about the four phases to them. And again, the, the level of detail that we go into is obviously age appropriate. But basically, the four phases around um, when we've got the ball, when we don't have the ball. So phase one would be building the attack, initiating, initiating the attack. So we've regained the ball. How do we build? Do we play through, around or behind? Uh, and then we work into phase two, which is finishing the attack. So thinking about the final third stuff, you know, crosses, shots, combinations. Um, and then we look at the possession stuff as well. So phase three would be beginning the press. So where on the pitch do we press? How do we press? How do you work on relationships as, you know, the presser or the supporting player? And then also phase four, which is, the, you know, the final part of the, the, the playing philosophy would be defend the goal. 
So emergency defending, how do we stop shots, stop crosses, how do we work in defending our goal, really? Um, and that's that's basically how our players and our coaching staff um, teach our players around the four phases. Now, that will be spread across the season. We do one phase per week, and we work that so literally from under sevens, under eights, all the way through to 23s. So if the 23s are on phase one, for example, this week, our under nines and our under 13s will be doing phase one as well. Uh, and I think that helps the movement of players, which we like to do. We like to move players up and across age groups. So that means that when a player moves up a group or across a group or down, um, he's still working on the same the same phase, the same principles, regardless of which group he's working with. So the message is still the same. It might be a little bit different, but uh, again, it just helps continuity and, and, and helps the structure, we believe, for, for our players. You have, like, in, in essence, like a four-week four, four week tactical cycle. Yes, yes. That's, that's in essence, what it is. You but, know, and again, that's underpinned by, by technical work um, with, with each age group. But and, again, that's a, the tactical focus. And then tell us a little bit about then under nines then. What is it like an under nine session? We're talking about, you know, winning the ball back, pressing. What does it look like yeah. an under nine session compared to maybe an under 11 session? Yeah, so our under nine session, again, right the way through the academy, it's, it's around hard, hard work. So an under nine session will start with, you know, the first day will be ball mastery. Again, just the, the player in their ball, 1v1s, individuals, maybe one ball between two at the most. Um, and that will evolve them in the, in the later session um, to 2v2 um, practices, 3v3 practices, 4v4 at the most. Um, just, again, thinking about dominating their opponent with and without the ball, competing, working hard. Um, we would like the players to have fun and emphasis around fun, but hard work underpins that all. And then we'll have um, some sort of... Not, I wouldn't say a phase of play, but a you know sort of four v three or a five versus four um, sort of practice. Again, depending on the phase, and that will evolve then into small sided games. And generally, the small sided games are condition games or, or or scenario based games that just give the players a different sort of spike and different learning objective rather than just playing you know seven v seven traditionally. Um, there is a place for that. Don't get me wrong, and we we do do seven v sevens, eight v eights, nine v nines in training, um, and that's part of our, our technical week. But again, you know, we'd like to scenario uh, and, and and condition the games at times for the boys just to help them help them learn around the phase and the, the playing philosophy for that week. So then, interesting. So then, um, so t- thinking about then uh, your coaches there, mm-hmm. how do you, how do they work in terms of is there a curriculum? Are there set sessions, or do they have freedom to do what? What's what's the practicality of a, of a coach at Wolves and he's trying to put a session on a plan? A yeah, session? that's a great question. We um we have some core sessions. So we have practices um, that we'd like the coach to deliver. Now, at the start of the season, we have a we have a coaches meeting, and each week we have a, a coaches meeting for for all of our staff, you know, for for coaching staff, and anybody's welcome to come. Where we discuss the sessions that we're delivering, you know, and if a, if a coach feels that really good phase one session that which they they've seen at you know athletic or bilbao wherever they've been you know and they can you know they can say well this is what we the returns that we want and this is going to be a great phase one session for our boys and i think it's great but we can put that into our practices so there's lots of flexibility as long as the coaching staff are delivering around you know the, the phase for that week and we can see the clear outcomes in what we what we're going to achieve that's um, that's fine by us there are some core practices like i mentioned that we would want the coaches to to deliver um because we've agreed that the outcomes are, you know, exactly what we want for that group. So there won't be as much flexibility around that. But you know, if you imagine that our session covers four parts, for example, across a two-hour session, thirty minutes each, roughly. Um, you know, two of those parts might be core sessions that we want coaches to deliver, and two of those can be flexible in terms of the coaching staff getting whatever returns they want to, as long as they're based around the, the playing philosophy. And so, um, um, you, go on, sorry. Are you, sorry, to interrupt you, mate. So, um, and you guys have your foundation phase you split into to nine till 12 uh, yes we do yeah i mean that's traditional ways nines to 11s i mean now yeah all clubs are doing nines to 12s tell us a little bit about yeah. your, your your thinking behind that yeah we started probably five or six years ago now <clears throat> excuse me and, and our thoughts was well we want the continuity for the players and there's so much change for you know for, for under 11 players in their in you know in their in their journey um under 11 they leave primary school go to senior school they go from arguably nine aside to 11 aside which you know is a different um, different debate altogether. So we thought, well, why not keep them in the foundation phase? Let's keep their, their 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 learning continuous. Let's keep the same sort of coaches around it. So you know we know their journey, where they've been so far, who's doing well, who needs to improve, what they need to improve on, what their background is, and that just gives us a little bit of continuity then for for elevens and twelves, help them remain, uh, sort of gives them some sort of consistency. 
Um, so, you know, the change from school isn't as bad because we've got some consistency here. And then we can develop their, their programme then to, to when they go from under 12 to under 13. So um, that was the theory behind it. And it's worked quite well. And I know a lot of clubs do it. Um, I'm not sure of many clubs that just do 9 to 11s now. I think a lot of clubs do 9 to 12. So um, it works for us. You know, it works for, for the schools as well because the teachers are quite, and the schools are quite pleased with the relationships we've built up uh, in the foundation phase. So the transition then from under 11 year six to year seven um, is, a, is a smoother one than it probably would be if we just detached the foundation phase at under 11. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that's a great idea. I think more and more clubs are doing that. I mean, mm. in some clubs I've heard um, in, on, is that sometimes basically you get in the foundation phase, uh, it's all about fun and, can do yeah. it and enjoying yourself and then you go into the YDP and it's like, suddenly, <laughs> oh, hang on, it's a different kettle of fish, forget all that, now it's a big, yeah. big game, let's go and do whatever. It's a completely different, different sort of yeah. Uh, culture on my way is different culture but completely different you know ideals as it were so how yeah. obviously how close are those your those those uh, is that that transition you know yeah it, is it is it easy for the players is it much, is there much much difference as in the ydp yeah i'd like to think it's it's a smooth transition because uh, you know it sounds a little bit a bit corny and a bit cheesy but our coaches and staff really do get on uh, and we've got a really good relationship with the full-time and part-time staff right the way through foundation to, to pro phase to the point where our 23s coaches come down and work with the 9s, 10s, 11s, 12s during the week. You know, so there's a, a really good relationship between the coaching staff and the players. So, you know, when the boys do transition from foundation phase to youth, um, there's not much difference because they know the coaching staff. The coaching staff know the boys. We, we've got a similar philosophy in terms of our, <coughs> excuse me, our coaching delivery anyway. So, you know, when the boys do come to an under-13 or 14 session, it's not all about winning. You know, it's um, it's it's about the technical tactical structure, but also the psych and social structure as well. Um, and you know, we're not overly concerned about winning at the youth phase. You know, it's 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 more about getting the boys through to to the pro phase, and that's where they can they can do their winning and that that final part of their their um their long term development in in that phase in terms of their winning. But you know, it's it's we feel that it's a smooth transition from from foundation to youth because the coaching staff know the boys; they've got a good relationship with each other anyway. Um, and again, the emphasis is not around winning; it's about working hard and, and you know learning the, the playing philosophy that the academy wants them to, to learn. So, tell us a little bit about the YDP then, uh, a little bit back mm-hmm. on the 13s to 16s about those those boys' experience. What's it like their day to day, and how much are those guys in? Yeah, so they'll be in. They'll be in five days a week. Some of the boys will be in six, but generally five. Um, they'll have at least one school school release um, day a week. Now, some of our players that are on the full programme, which I'm, I'm sure you're aware of, that'll come in for four morning a week. Um, and, you know, if you're looking at some of our 15s and 16s, it's fantastic on a Thursday morning because they're not only coming and work with, <coughs> excuse me, the under 16 boys, but with the, the coaching structure that we've got at the moment, that some under 15s can go and work with the 18s. And also, they'll find themselves sometimes working with the 23s because our coaches like to, to push boys and, and move boys across age groups if they warrant it. So um, so that's part of their week when they come in. Um, again, they'll train in the evenings as well. But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very programme. We've got so many players on different programmes at the moment, full-time programme and, and, and hybrid programmes, etc. Um, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a good opportunity for boys to come in. And again, like I say, it's for a 15-year-old to come and work with the under-18s or 23s coaching staff and, and play with some ex-pro, sorry, um, play with some first team pros who you know are going to be dropping down for a short period. It's it's great for that. Our boys learning. Let's just tell a little bit about the full time program. What's what is that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, so we have um, we have two partner schools at Wolves, and and what our boys will do, they'll um, you know if they, if they're deemed that they should be on that program, which uh, allows them to more coaching time, more more access to the coaching the coaching program at the club. <clears throat> They'll likely go to one of our partner schools, uh, where we have probably a little bit more flexibility in terms of their academic program. So, you know, for example, a boy could go to to, to school, school one, um, Thomas Telford, and then they'll come out four mornings a week, go back to school in the afternoon, and arguably come back to, to, to train with us in the evening. So the full-time programme just allows players to get a little bit more contact time rather than um, to be in school as, as much as some of the other boys do. Now, that opens its own debate because, obviously, you know, on one hand, we know that, again, we know the retention rates of, of players at clubs and, you know, some people may argue that if they're at, at, at football club all the time, then they miss out on education. So we find now that it's important that if a boy does come out of school for a morning, they're doing some education here as well. You know, so if they're missing, for example, science at, at school because they're out with us, they'll do an hour of science before or after training uh, at the club. So they don't they don't miss out as much. 
you know, and that's important to us because again, we know that not everybody's going to going to go and make it. But once they leave the football club, they need to leave with you know a good education and a, you know a good a grounding as a young man. And so, so what age does that full time start? Full time program. We start as at, at U twelve, um, under twelve. So we've got some boys on that on that program there. Um, but again, generally, I know some clubs may differ, uh, and they might start slightly later full time. But we have the you know a great um, we've got a great relationship with two schools in the Wolverhampton and, and Telford area. So uh, we, we're able to start that at U twelve and get the boys a little bit more contact time who go to that school. So it's um, it's been it's been very good. And a bit of a difficult, you know, bit of a, sorry. Bit of a difficult question for you, mate. But I mean. Mm-hmm. But how do you deal with those kids who are on the full time program and then the other kids yep. who are on the hybrid? What's, I mean, that must be one difficult making a decision and two dealing with the yep. post uh, decision. Yeah, that's that's a challenge, and you know, it's a challenge for all, for all coaches. And you know, it's uh, it's not a decision that we take lightly. Um, we have various meetings across the season about about plays in general, and it's not just a coaching coaching meeting. It's a it's a multidisciplinary meeting. So we talk education pro, education progress for the boys sports science and you know it literally across all disciplines so if we're making a decision on a player to come onto the full-time program that's a commitment for us for them to, to be with us till 16 so we have to make sure that it's right that not only they're going to perform in terms of their footballing but academically they're not going to suffer they're hopefully going to thrive by by being on that program so it's not a decision that we we take easily and we don't just you know put anybody onto that program um there's a lot of thought thought around it and you know we don't want it to be the de- detriment to the player so um, it's it's a tough process. It's a tough process, but we believe it's the right one. And you know we've got players like Morgan Gibbs White now. We've played. He's playing for our third team. Who was was lucky enough to go to to one of our partner schools, come on the full time program, and you know we feel it benefited him. Um, so it's it's good. It's good. But then um, I, I just saw that recently there was a, a productivity table for the mm-hmm. and um, uh, Wolves sat top in terms of the Midland clubs. So they were lo- yep. the most productive <laughs> academy, which I'm, I'm sure you're glad to. Yeah. Hear. Uh, yeah, is that? I mean, obviously, you know, we know we know the uh, the, the environment. You live in a in a very uh, an area where there's lots of different clubs around. So, yeah. I mean, how important is that? Be you know, being the most productive academy in, in the Midlands. You know, it, it's great, and it's um, it's a it's a great stat to say that we're you know we're at the top of the, the productivity table in the in the Midlands, and you're right, it is a saturated area, and you know we've got good relationships with with all the clubs in the in the Midlands area, and, and again. All the clubs in the Midlands do do some great stuff. You know, there's the great development programs at, at local rival clubs. As, you know, as, as you probably you probably know. So, um, you know, it's, it's great for Midlands clubs to, to be doing well. But for us personally to be top of that table is, is excellent. It's a sort of testimony to, to what the staff are doing at the club. It's not just you know just us in terms of the academy, but the first team managers giving giving boys a chance. Again, like Morgs and 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 Connor Ronan, etc., uh, getting into the first team. So it, it's not just an academy effort; it's it, it's a club effort. You know, getting the boys into that into that first team. So it's it's good for us. You know, it, it allows us to you know attract players and you know boys who come into the the program at a young age and see there's a pathway. You know, if we're recruiting under sevens, eights, as you know all clubs do, you know to to see a pathway for for people like Morgs to get from under eights when he first come in into the first team that gives that gives boys a bit of hope. And that's what it's about, isn't it? Really, you know, giving boys a chance to get into the first team um, without hitting that glass ceiling. I mean, yeah, that, that was going to be my next question. Talking about the pro phase, I mean, so what? I mean, what what have your strategies been? You know, getting players over this apparent wall. We've talked about so much on this show yeah. where players uh, don't get the opportunity in Premier League academy football and then pro football. What what have your strategies been to to combat that and, and made you successful in this area? I think we've, we've we've been sort of transparent in the in the amount of opportunities we can get for the boys. You know, our, our pro face staff are excellent in terms of moving boys up if they warrant it, um, and, and put, putting them under the gaffer's nose really. So again, you know, Morgs last year, eighteen months ago, was training the twenty three as a sixteen year old. You know, and he deserved the opportunity. And you know, we we pushed and pushed into you know to get in around the first team, and the rest he, he did himself. So again, I think that the coach is giving young lads a chance right the way through the through the club, especially at pro phase, is is an excellent sort of uh, accolade for for the club, and it's something that we we're really proud of. Um, you know, and, and, and again, Scott Sellers, a twenty three is coach, and, and Darren Ryan, one of the eighteen coaches, pushing boys and giving them chances is, is is a real sort of positive for us to get over that sort of glass ceiling and and break through it really for for our young boys, and the fact that they know they've got a chance. Gives them sort of inspiration, um, you know. With respect, there's some clubs that, that don't give boys a chance, and it's difficult for boys. I appreciate with with first teams doing so well, and you know, I'm not gonna 
sort of be naive enough to say that when we're in the Premier League, the, 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 the opportunities will still be the same. But now it's a new challenge for us. Hopefully when we get promoted, that we, we need to produce players for the Premier League now, you know, not just for with respect championship. Interesting. And I mean, look, I, I've been up to your facility, amazing facility. Thank you. One of, the, one of the best in the country in terms of what you're providing for the players. Tell us mm-hmm. about, you know, your, your being a Cat One club, that journey to getting there and what it, what it means to you in, in practice. Yeah, it's again. It's been it's been a tough journey since CPP uh, P started what, seven seven years ago now, eight years ago, whenever it was. Um, it's it's been tough, and you know we've we've always tried to adhere to high standards. Um, you know, in the first year that we got audited, we, we were lucky enough to be to be cat one due to the hard work and of the staff. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the, the program we've got in place. The last audit cycle, we um, we were cat one again, and 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 we we're in the top three in terms of. Um, uh, cap one clubs in the country, so I, think, I believe we're just behind Man City and Chelsea in terms of in terms of where we are. So to be, you know, the third best club in the country, third best academy in the country is, is excellent. Um, but it's took a lot of hard work. It's been, you know, it's been well led by the academy manager Gareth Prosser, and you know the whole team around him have been, you know, contributing massively to it. You know, and it just just again just allows boys when they come to the club to a see there's an opportunity at the club. As you said, the facilities are are excellent here. We're quite fortunate enough to to have good facilities, so the boys coming in see that, um, and you know they also get exposed to a, a good coaching program as well. So you know we again the cat one means a lot to us because um, you know you know as well as, as I do it helps attract players, it helps get the, the best boys into into the club, but it also means that we can push for for better facilities, better coaching programs, better education, and, you know, and keep pushing the boundaries. And um, what would you say, you know, some people argue that, you know, maybe the young players have it too good these days, you know, the facility yeah. is too good, the fridge is too good, There's, you know, what's your what's your um, your response to those sorts of uh, arguments? You know what, on, on one hand, I, I think the boys do get too much too soon and that's something that we try and do, again, right the way through the club is keep the boys grounded, you know, it's it's not easy to do, I can imagine that, you know, 23s and, and 18s level when when boot deals come through and, and, and contracts, etc., it's difficult to keep boys grounded. Um, but we try to do that. Um, again, it's 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 not easy. It's it's not an not an easy task. Um, but you know that's what, that's one of the challenges we face, isn't it? As a as a club. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but it's it's it, it splits opinions, isn't it? I suppose the other argument is look look at the success you're having and you know having the, the facilities and the organisation and the infrastructure yeah. is obviously not doing those boys any harm, is it? No, and again, you, you know, we get, we're, <clears throat> excuse me, we're getting boys into into around the first team, training with the first team every, all, all the time, you know, and having these facilities helps it, again allow a good provision, an excellent pr- provision for the for the boys in terms of you know excellent education opportunities here while while they're at the club. Um, and again, once they're once they're in the environment and they're and developing well, well, the opportunity is there for them. So you know, on one hand, there is a lot for the boys. There's a lot, you know, the the, the program is an excellent one. You know, the facilities around that they get to train in are, are are excellent. But again, it, it's it's giving them the opportunity to um to progress into the, the you know twenty threes and first team. That's 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 the build end all, isn't it? Really, we've got to produce players for for the first team, and you know that's what we're doing at the moment. So, um, so you, talk, you mentioned a bit then, you know, about the first team <coughs> very well. I mean, you have got new owners, um, yeah, more money coming into the club. Uh, what has that had any um, any changes on on the academy day to day, or or is maybe is now, like you said, maybe the expectations are changing. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'd say that now, you know, as we hopefully approach the Premier League, um, you know, the expectations now are not just to provide you know players who can go and play in a Championship, but as I said, you can go and play in the first team. In the Premier League, um, and that's again that's pushing the boundaries. Now the owners have been excellent. You know they give us the opportunity to, um, you know, to, to push the boundaries in terms of get on more tours and tournaments, which we believe provides a better opportunity for players to learn. You know, about winning and, and, and tournament experience. Uh, they've also been good in terms of improving the facilities as well. So they, you know, they've, they've really supported the academy. Um, but we've got to do our bit now, and you know, and push and get players into into the first team. Um, so uh, you know, and provide the, the best boys that we can. So again, that's a different challenge now when we were, when we're in the Premier League. And has it turned? Has it changed in terms of recruitment? Um, we're talking about maybe sixteens upwards. Are there more players coming from outside the the uh, you know the, the the original catchment area you might look at? Are you looking further afield? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so you know we've got the opportunity to recruit nationally, and again with the full time programs we've got, 
available to the boys and our partner schools, you know, that enables us to, to really sort of go and find the best players that, that you know, not just in the, in the Midlands, but nationally as well. So, um, we've, again, we've got a good recruitment team in, in, in place and a good recruitment strategy. Um, so, we're, again, we're just searching for the best boys now. And, you know, it's um, we try and do things in the right way, provide the boys with, with an opportunity to come to the club, in the, you know, in the right way and do our recruitment and due diligence in the right way. But, um, you know, again, the demands, the demands on us. So then, um, so I mean, where, so give us an example. Then, where where do these some of these players come from? Where where's the, where's these, where have you brought players in from? Um, again, nationally. So we've brought boys in from from London way. Um, you know, recruited from there. We've brought boys in from from north of the border. So we've brought you know um, a couple of our one of our scholars. He's he's from Scotland. Uh, one of our young pros is from Scotland as well. Um, again, Ireland is a, is a place that we've always been active and and recruited very well from. Um, so that's that's been we've been a little bit further afield as well. So we've brought a boy in from from Hungary. Um, so again, it's not just again national and regional. It's we've gone European and we're trying to get the best boys that are around for for the club. And then in, in terms of, I mean, you uh, obviously a big club, but I mean compared to maybe you know we all uh, Man City maybe in United those big mm. north. How much um, how much are you effect do they have on you guys do they often come in and, and recruit your players I mean we've all you know we've experienced that you know there's always a big yeah. fund as it were yeah so we, we we haven't had it um you know they haven't affected us with respect too much at the moment you know and that's that's what I believe because we've got such a strong program in place um that the boys enjoy enjoy being here you know we're not naive enough to think that you know if an opportunity is there that some boys may not may not want to go to you know perceives a bigger club but again I think the opportunity and the you know the provision we provide for the boys is here is excellent so you know the boys want to stay and want to be here because you know they can follow the pathway of Morgan and and, and those boys into the first team so I think that's the, the big pull that we've got here you know the opportunity in the staff that we've got allows and, and, and encourages boys to stay at the, stay at the club and, and you know and stick with with what's a successful program and I think as we as we evolve and as you know as, as things change across the country, I think a lot of boys will see that, that they're probably better off at, you know, what's perceived as a slightly smaller club um, because they get opportunity, as long as the opportunity is there. And that's, you know, maybe a criticism of some of the big clubs that they don't get opportunity. Um, and I think if we're going to succeed nationally, you know, and continue to produce boys for the national team, um, we need to keep that opportunity available for them. But then uh, talk about yourself then. Um, you mentioned a bit earlier, but how do you develop yourself as a coach, how do you? What, what's your professional development look like, and and how do you go about that? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm sort of quite keen on professional development, and I'm, I'm quite keen to get get on courses and get involved in different different learning different ways to learn. So I'm currently on ECAS, um, which is run by the Premier League, which is the Elite Coach Apprenticeship Scheme, which is probably a step away from the grass in terms of my delivery and and, and how I'd work on the on the grass with players, but it's more a bit more personal development in terms of. Um, understanding myself and understanding other people in terms of their emotional intelligence and, and, and a lot of social and psychological theory um, around relationships with people uh, and that's been a really good sort of part of my personal development in the last 18 months or so you know just finding out how, how, it's about how I learn better as a person and how I, my relationships are, are built with other people and what I respond to well and what I don't respond to um, as well so um, it's also challenged me in terms of my leadership and my communication as well so that's been a real good part of my personal development to be on that course um, obviously in terms of my A licence and Advanced Youth Award they've been a, a massive factor in my development you know working with the players understanding the technical and tactical um, elements of the game but recently being on ECAS has, has, has helped helped me massively in terms of my role and my, my evolution Is that ECAS? Is that, you say it's an FA course is it? It's a Premier League course, so it's um, it's more Premier League. It's a two-year course, um, and it takes you out your comfort zone a little bit. You know, it, it's not just a, again, it's not a football course. It's going to different environments. You know, we've been to Sky uh, Productions to see how they work and how they communicate and lead. Uh, we've also spent thirty-six hours with the military um, over Brecon Beacons, working on survival and, and you know sleeping outside and and leading under pressure when you're tired and, and, and cold and hungry. So again, just different elements to sort of test you as a person rather than you know just the grass and the technical tactical stuff that we've you know we've, we've all sort of been on for our journey. Quite unique in England compared to other countries. You've got the FA mm. Premier League. Obviously, you're a Premier League academy, so yeah. you're you're uh, categorised by the Premier League. Um, yeah, but, I mean, what what else do the Premier League do to support you guys? And then, how does that work having the FA and the Premier League, you know, sitting side by side like that? Yeah, so I mean, again, the, the, my personal experience of the Premier League is again they've been supportive of me personally very very recently in going on on ECAS, and I think they're providing more ways 
for, for coaching staff to learn and evolve now. And I've, I think they've sort of consciously not just left it to the football, the, you know, the football association now, the FA, just in terms of that that, that learning. But I think now with, with the evolution of ECAS and EHOC for elite heads of coaching, that's been a major step in, in, in terms of developing coaches. Um, you know, the FA has always been excellent for me personally in terms of courses, uh, Advanced Youth Award has been very good you know you and I were on a few courses when we were younger um, and we've always found them you know to be to be really enhancing in terms of you know working with players and building relationships with, with young players um, you know and I think that the, the Premier League and the FA you now are really making a conscious effort to to enhance their relationship and, and work together better not just for you know for, for coaching staff but for the good of the, the national national game really um, and that was probably a criticism of, of the two organisations three or four years ago that it didn't work as well um, but I think you know you've got some good people in in charge of you know the FA and the Premier League who who want to develop and want to, to enhance relationships. So you know in the last year especially you've seen a lot of collaboration events with the Premier League and the FA, um, and long may that continue. Really, how how important do you think was the Triple P in uh, creating an environment now when we've got such an, a successful uh, academy system in terms of what our England youth teams are, are doing at the moment. Yeah, I, I think it's massive, you know, and at the time it's, it was a lot of pressure on the coaching staff and a lot of pressure on academies uh, in terms of the, 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 uh, the criteria and the KPIs, the key performance indicators that they had to achieve. Um, and at the time, you know, I remember going through the first audit process thinking, wow, this is, this is a lot of hard work and it's quite intense and the pressure around it to be a Category 1 academy is, you know, is massive. But, you know, on reflection, you look at the England teams now succeeding and, and boys that are coming through, you know, part of this improved coaching structure, you know, it can only be a good thing, you know, if clubs are getting better facilities, more full-time coaching staff, better education facilities as well, you know, and, 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 and enhancements in, in different areas of the, you know, the multidisciplinary programme, it's, it's only going to help the players holistically. And, and for me, that's what it's about. You know, I, I want players in our first team, I want players to, to come in at under six, under seven, um, like Morgan did and like others are, are, are will do behind him and get into their first team. But I want to see England, England and the national teams winning. And, you know, again, I think we go back to opportunities. If they get opportunities in the first team and experience playing league football and Premier League football, then we'll have a, a successful national team. And I think, again, the EPPP has been, you know, a key part of that just by raising the standards and, you know, enhancing and providing opportunities for, for more staff to and better staff to work in football. So you're talking about staff there. Tell us a bit about then your, you, how do you go to about recruiting coaches? What exactly do you look for in a, in a, in a new coach and how do you go about getting coaches through the door? Yeah, I think um, I think enthusiasm and, and the willingness to, to work and learn is is massive. You know, I've seen uh, you know with respect some coaches who are technically and tactically excellent in terms of the, you know their knowledge, but if they don't want to to learn and improve, then I don't think they're going to be quite right for the club. Uh, and also, if their communication and their their relationship with players isn't great, then they're not going to improve our, our players at the club. So I think that's a that's a massive thing for us. You know, willingness to to learn and improve and to work. And also the ability to to work with players and have a, a good relationship with players and staff is is important as well. So you know, and that's not that's not easy to find. You know, we've, we've recently recruited some some good staff over the last year or so. Um, and, you know, and we've had a sort of a good intensive search to find these these guys. And you know, we've, we've come across some good candidates with respect to, again lots of lots of well qualified coaching staff who maybe qu- haven't quite had the. Um, the, the, the ability to, to work with players as we probably like. Um, so again, that those those factors for me and for the academy are, are very important. You know, and we can support the other aspects of, of their development. Um, you know, if they're not quite technically tactically great, well, we can help that as part of our role, my role, to improve them in that way. Um, but again, if they've got some factors in terms of working hard and, and, and the ability to, to to communicate well with players, and that's a, that's a great start for me. And what about players then? What's the, the general recruitment model for players? What exactly are you looking for at Wolves? Yeah, again, that's not far off what we want from our coaches, really. And that sort of ties into our, our Wolves way, which is, you know, which underpins what the club's about in terms of working hard, being organised, showing leadership qualities, you know, having values, um, being well-educated and successful. You know, that's uh, the, Wolves, the Wolves way is an acronym that we, we live by. And we want our players to be exactly the same as our coaches, you know, hard-working, you know, good, communi- good communicators have good social relationships that is important to us. Um, you know, and the, you know the ability to, to learn and to listen and want to improve. Again, you you know, so you've seen hundreds of players who've gone to play top level, but you know, sometimes if they can't communicate, they're not going to get to where they want to get to. Um, if they're not going to have good relationships and listening and learning skills, then they're, they're not going to achieve all that they could, potentially could do in the game. 
And then just tell us a bit about, I mean, running, again, I don't want to keep too long, so we'll just kind of go through these last questions. Uh, tell us a bit about mm-hmm. the role about sports science and what does that play within the academy, within the foundation phase and YDP and in, currently? Yeah, it's it, it, for me, it's evolved massively uh, and that can only be a good thing. You know, when I first started with the academy, there was probably one sports scientist who would work with the older age groups um, and there wasn't much for, for the younger guys. You know, if we, we look at, our programme now, and again, I can't speak for other clubs, but our sports science programme is something that, you know, we're really proud of because, you know, we get six, seven, eight-year-olds all the way through to, to 18, 23s, and they're not just doing strength and core and, and, and jumping and, and um, working on the movement techniques, but they're doing, our young guys do, again, as I said, multi-sport, which is led by the sports scientists, but they're also doing movement, rolling, jumping, landing, different body movements, different ways to, you know, to manipulate the body, um, which are going to be related back to, back to the sport, you know, and, we look at our four phases and our sports science guys now will look at phase four, for example, which is defend the goal. And they put a sports science program for that week and their, their warm-up program for the boys will, will essentially be around what the players will need in terms of their movement to defend the goal. So it might be lateral movements with their body shape being you know slightly, slightly lower in that jockey position, for example, doing movements around that, um, jumping for headers, etc. So that program will work around what, our football program looks like so again you know working with sports science is, is massive and i think it's again the better relationships you can build with your sports science department the better the players will become and you know i think we need to get away from you know sports scientists doing their 15 minute warm-up while the coaching staff stand away um and, or set up i think we need to get the coaching staff involved in the sports science warm-up making sure that you know the, the boys are switched on they're listening and learning uh, and again we, we should utilize the sports science staff around around the football program as well so again if that means sports scientists taking players out for five minutes while you're doing a you know a phase of play well, well no problem at all i think that's that's great uh, the more we can work with different departments the better because it's only going to benefit the players okay and um you're one of the uh the few clubs academies now that can say they've got a world cup winner uh, yep their ranks obviously you know one of the boys went lifted the world cup as a, a wolves boy what's that mean for for the academy and the club having a world cup winner you know coming through your academy you know it's it's massive it's a massive first of all it's, it's great for morgan to to be involved in it and and, and and to lift the world cup it's it's fantastic for him it's fantastic for the club because again i remember when morgan first came in as an eight-year-old in you know pre-academy um seeing him then you know, evolving to into a young man who goes to play to play in our first team and playing, you know, a World Cup final and scoring that is is massive. And it just gives, you know, the academy staff and the academy players that come into the club now, um, just, you know, belief belief that, you know, if we keep doing the things that we're doing, which we you know, we believe is right, we're gonna produce players not only capable of playing in the championship and the first team, but who can go and play on the world stage and, you know, be effective with your you know, your Phil Foden's and your Jaden Sancho's who are, you know, arguably top of the game similar to Morgan. Um, so it's been a it's been a massive boost and a massive achievement for for all the staff. You know, it's not just coaching staff or sports scientists, but I think we firmly believe that it, you know part of it was you know the cleaners, the drivers who've picked Morgan up when he when needed to and took him to games, etc. You know, it's the education staff who've kept him in check at school when you know when you know he's um, he's on for his GCSEs, etc. It's a holistic program that you know has benefited Morgs and you know it just gives everybody involved in the club a, a massive boost and say, well, come on in, he's done excellently well. Who's next? Go on, mate. Yeah, I'm just going to say who, who's that, who's next. Who's the next one now? So we've got Morgan through. Um, who's the next one? And you know we've got two or three that are in and around the 23s now that, that are pushing the first team. Um, so we've got to keep going. I mean, it's quite interesting there just to briefly talk about that. I mean, you, you, I mean, there's a lot said about academies and uh, structured environments, but we've got basically you know you know the vast majority of that that team that who you know involved in that all came through the academy from the foundation phase came through academy so yep. testament to, to to academies like yourself who can produce quality technical creative footballers uh, mm-hmm. maybe you know throws one in the face of that game's the teacher uh, that argument yeah no it's spot on it's spot on again it's it, like, as you say it's testament to all all the clubs that are involved and you know it's people work hard enough you know sometimes coaching staff don't get the, you know the, the the praise that they deserve, and you know not, not just the coaching staff, but the other the other support staff around it. And again, to see boys go and progress into first team, or you know just to achieve their their own personal goals, is is what it's about. And I think that's what we're we're all in it for, really. And so then, just just uh, what 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 um, advice would you give for a young aspiring coach who wants to you know get to a senior role like yourself in in you know, one of the top academies? Yeah, I think um, be open minded. You know, don't don't think that first of all, you know, you just get you you qualified as your B licensed coach, or you've got your, you know, your um, youth modules that you can go straight into academy football. You know, yes, you could, but for me, really, I, I believe that being 
able to, to work at grassroots, go and work at different levels, district level, for example, or, or county level, or work in the girls' game, I think that gives you a massive foundation then to go and work in academy football. Um, I see a lot of coaches who just want to come straight off getting a qualification, straight into academy football, and then maybe haven't got the, the ability to communicate with, with, with young players that they, they might do if they've gone and done different aspects of you know of, of football coaching. And, and similarly, if you, you know if you feel that you're a, a U16s coach, well, why not come and work with the U9s, for example? You know, and, and be open-minded enough to just go and work with different age groups to get you know a different type of experience. And I think that's that's really important for for young coaches or old coaches who are coming into the game, with respect whatever level they're coming into. You know, be open-minded and be willing to to work and 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 put the put the hours in really because it's not you don't get um you don't get all the glory straight <laughs> early on. It's uh, it's a long process and it's you know it's it's a good process to be involved in. You know, I wouldn't change my my journey for anything. Um, but you know, I've been fortunate enough to have some good support staff and good people guide me along the way. And what about you know, advice for a young player who wants to to make it all the way, like uh, Morgan, and go and you know win a World Cup medal? Yeah, again, just work hard um, and, and and never never let anybody you know talk talk you out of achieving your dreams um, in academy football. So you know as as well as I do that you know a large amount of boys won't get to where they want to want, want to get to. You know, and there's a lot of rejection in academy football, unfortunately. Um, but you know, a lot of boys have setbacks and and, and, and go and prove you know clubs wrong. You know, it's sort of like your Jamie Vardy's and your, your Andre Gray's, for example, who um, who arguably didn't get get totally taken on as young players, but come back and have succeeded well in the Premier League so you know young players don't 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 be disheartened if you have any rejection you know look at the reasons why you didn't quite what quite do well at a club uh, and turn those into positives and give yourself a, a, a platform to go and to go and push on and, and, and work a little bit harder and get to where you want to get to um, and the, the main thing is enjoy the game you know again I see a lot of boys at different clubs not enjoying the game and you know Unfortunately, don't don't enjoy football, and that's that's not what it's about. You know, every boy starts at you know whatever age it is, or every girl starts at you know three, four, five, six years old because they want to play football and want to enjoy it. So I think that's that's the main thing. If you can enjoy the game and you know you can make a career out of, out of playing football, but enjoy it, well, you know what a great career that is. And finally, I, I can't let you go about mentioning it. You mentioned it earlier. My personal football coach. You, you guys, yep. the the online the resource, the app for. For three seasons now, just uh, give us a bit of feedback on on that. Your experience with using my personal football coach for your players. Yeah, it, it, my personal football coach has been has been excellent for us. You know, it's a it's a great way for the boys to to work on you know the, the skills program that we want them to work on when they're away from the club, and it also gives us a great way to check and challenge them when they are in the club. You know, to see if they've been doing their homework and you know give them little little um, competitions to try and aspire to and trying to be top of the the group. So it's been excellent for us really, and you know the service that. That my personal football coach has provided, you know, away from the away from football has been has been good as well. You know, the, the support mechanism has been been excellent, and you know, you can see our boys technically improving because they're actually practicing at home and they've got that enjoyment and enthusiasm to go and want to practice at home, which is which has been really good. You know, and, you know, arguably they're with us for seven eight hours a week, our younger players. Um, but if they can go home and practice for an extra half an hour a day or fifteen minutes a day, well, that just builds up, doesn't it? Um, and that's been that's been really good. Mark. Appreciate your time. I know you're very busy, man. Thank you. It's been fantastic and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thank you, pal. Perfect. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.